Hello, and welcome to the Mindful Millionaire podcast and YouTube channel. I'm your host, Lisa Peterson, and I am so very excited to be introducing you today to Katie Kremitzos. Katie founded the Women's Meditation Network, and she has had tremendous success. She has over 20 podcasts now, 4 million monthly downloads. And what we're talking about is the inspiration behind her success, what she's learned along the way, how she got to this kind of success, what she's done inside of the podcast, inside of her business with money, how she had to change her money mindset, and the things that have helped propel her into this phenomenal success. I know you're going to love the conversation. Katie is so humble. It was such a fun time. It just kept went longer than I thought because there was so much exciting, interesting information being shared. Enjoy. Katie, I am so happy that we are here today together. Lisa, I feel like bro, like we had this nice little conversation a couple of weeks ago and I'm like, yay, I'm talking to my sister. <laughs> <laughs> it's like immediately we spoke the same language. We were like in it. So I'm so grateful to be here. I love, love our conversations already. Yeah. When we talked, I was like, please, please, please let me share what's happening in this connection with other people, because I knew that whatever we talk about, other people will get something out of it. And so thank you for accepting my invitation. And absolutely, I was, I was saying off, offline that my good friend, Dustin, our friend, Dustin uh, Heiner introduced us, but he didn't give any preface about you except Oh, you both like meditation. So when we met, I didn't know about your story. And I think it was so refreshing and so beautiful because it actually made our meeting even more special because you are so humble and you are so down to earth in sharing your journey. And I just want to tell you, like, I really appreciate that. And I'm sure everyone's going to feel that when they start to learn more about what you have accomplished in the past Thank you. several years. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I, yeah, I thought it was really interesting. Like, hey, you both like meditation, just talk. Um, and I, I love that because I feel like that gives us such a pure space to start from. So I, I appreciate that feedback. I felt the same way about you where I have had a lot of the wow moments like, Mm, all right. I like this girl. Okay. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> so could you summarize a little bit about, you know, where, what you've accomplished, what you've done in this past few years? Cause I just want to say it's a remarkable. And the thing that I am so excited to share about your story is you are someone who is by, by my impression, following your passion, making money, doing that, doing something that's totally aligned with your heart and soul. And how did you like, tell us what that, what that is? <laughs> well, when I first became an entrepreneur back in 2009, I would not, I, I think I dreamed about doing this and was very green about the fact that like, of course I can make money doing what I love. And then, you know, kind of like sank deep into the school of hard knocks of actually having to make money doing something because I wasn't getting a regular paycheck. Right. Um, so I, I'll, I'll kind of give a snapshot of, of who I am and what I do now, knowing that there's an enormous amount of, um, you know, imperfections and ups and downs leading up to what I think is, is a really profound season of my career and my money life and my professional life and my spiritual life. Um, so right now I am the the founder and the creator of the Women's Meditation Network. Um, in this moment, we have 20 different podcasts that are a part of the network. Um, the network started because, well, and I'll just give you a little bit of a size and a scope. Um, it started about six years ago, almost six years ago, with one podcast called Meditation for Women, uh, where, you know, at the time I was pregnant uh, with my second kid, and I was just sort of like, can I get one episode out a week? <laughs> Let's figure that out. Um, I was not known for meditation. Um, I was not somebody who, uh, you know, garnered attention because of meditation. Actually, most people didn't even know that I meditated by the time that I, you know, launched the show. Um, but I had been a meditator for a long time uh, since I was in my late teens, and it was just a tool that I knew was was really profound for me, really powerful for me. So 
Um, but coupled with that, I'm a writer and I've always wanted to be a writer. So, uh, you know, when you say the words like you're somebody who's living out your passions and your gifts, like I consider myself as a creator, a writer and somebody who can express really well in writing and who can make writing pretty universal so that the person reading or listening in this experience is is feeling like they're heard, they're seen, and that it can really touch their soul. So, so I knew I could write these scripts. I knew I could write really beautiful scripts that would be poetic and could really speak to kind of share my experiences as a human, as a woman, as somebody who struggles with all the ups and downs, somebody who wants to live her best. And I could sort of like translate that and package that within a meditation. So, um, so it started almost six years ago with the one show. We now have 20 shows, as I mentioned, and um, we get about a little over 4 million downloads every single month. Um, to date, just shy of six years, we have about 150 million downloads um, total lifetime. Um, and humbly speaking, that puts us in about the 0.1 percentile of, uh, of all podcasters. So I'm incredibly grateful for what I get to do at this point. Um, you know, what I what I feel like I've evolved into is sort of like, you know, from this writer creator, I want to speak to this woman to this writer creator. I want to speak to the woman listening. And I'm now the CEO of this media company who is doing her best to scale in a meaningful way and sort of own all of the prosperity, the the holistic prosperity that comes al along with that. Oh, people are still like, wait a minute, what were those numbers? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, like, does it still surprise you that this has happened? Um, it, it, I don't think it surprises me. I, I'm simultaneously incredibly creative and, you know, can speak into the space of thinking big and manifesting and I'm simultaneously kind of addicted to stats and data and, you know, am very much an operator. So I feel like um, it's it does stop me and humble me quite often. Like, oh, my gosh. And I, I know this in comparative in, in comparison, not only to sort of like the broad, uh, you know, kind of landscape of podcasters, but I was a podcaster before this business, before this podcast, before this network. Um, I had a women's podcast uh, all about women in business and, and that podcast I did for like six years by itself. And so, and it was a lot smaller. It was like getting like 5,000 downloads a month and it garnered a really great business for me. I was a strategic business consultant. I, I did masterminds. I loved it. Um, but I could see the difference. I mean, I've had these very two different podcasting lives. And so I can, I can quite often appreciate the difference, but I will say, um, I walked into this wide eyes wide open. I was very intentional about how what this business would be. Like what I'm experiencing now, I saw six years ago when I first envisioned what this business could be. Now, now my job is to constantly sort of widen that vision and say, okay, now what am I what am I going after? Like what are we wanting to build and who are we wanting to affect? Not only listeners, but team members now and you know how it impacts their lives, how it impacts my contractors, how it impacts um you know, partners that I'm working with. So um, it's been, a, it's been, it's been expanding the dream, but also like, I feel like every step of the way, I've been very intentional about what I'm creating. So it makes a lot of sense to have that kind of success. And it's not like you fell into it as what I'm hearing, like you had a vision and you were adapting to that vision as you went along. I'm curious is it possible to look at who you were before you started this round of podcasting in comparison to who you've become? Like, who have you become as a result of this success? Yes. Oh, that's such a good question. I've, as we all do, we evolve, right? And so, yes, I have become a very different person in the best of ways. I think what this evolution of my podcasting journey, my business journey, my money journey has been, has, it has forced me to take full ownership of my professional life and dreams, my financial life and dreams and my lifestyle, like what I want to create for my lifestyle. So I feel like I have gratefully and, and happily sort of become the woman who 
who does run this company. So like these big visions I had, these big dreams that I have had, I had six years ago. My question for quite some time was like, who do I need to become in order to have this? So like back then I was, you know, doing one podcast, one episode per week, pregnant with a toddler. And so I would have these big visions of like, I know I'm growing a network. I know I'm growing into that where I have it. It's built in that I can create time freedom and financial freedom within what I'm building, right? Those were two big reasons behind why I was building what I was building. And so my question was always like, who do I need to become in order to have that, in order to, to realize that? And so the woman I am now versus the woman I was six years ago is a hell of a lot more rooted in myself. I am very, very clear about my inner voice, my inner guidance, um, that has helped me along the way, not only to actually start this podcast and this network, but every step along the way, you know, it's worth noting that for the first three years I was underwater, like I was in the red for the first three years, because not only was it cost, like, not only was I not making money, uh, a lot of money for the, for the podcast and the network, but I was putting out a lot of my own personal money in order to finance what I believed in. I mean, we took out, like we refied and took out, out cash of our home, like got a second mortgage and literally put 80% of that money into this business um, because I believed in it. And I was like, I know, I know at some point it's going to turn, <laughs> I'm going to do this. Um, so, you know, I feel like, um, so in the, just as an example, in those first couple of years, I had come from a podcasting business where I knew how to sell a high, high ticket product, right? I knew how to sell a high ticket, you know, time with me, a mastermind, all those sorts of things that, that were quick to, to create. So at any given moment during those first couple of years, when I was like, oh, like my PNL was not so pretty, I could have easily launched whatever meditation program and, you know, a little retreat or what, what have you. I could have easily launched those things that would have given me easy access to quick cash um, but I knew I did not want that. I was like, I am not building that business. I'm building a completely different business and I'm willing to stick this out, um, in order to have this type of a business versus this type of a business. So, so yeah, I feel like it, I am somebody who's a lot more grounded in myself and I'm a lot more, uh, I'm a lot wiser to how I want my company to be what I want this this entire, the mission of this company to be and how I want that to roll out, who I want to partner with, who I don't want to partner with. Um, so I feel like I'm just a lot more secure in settling and navigating myself along this road. That is really, really interesting. And I like how you talked about the money piece, because probably people wouldn't necessarily know about those decisions that you had to make and the the risk that you had to take in order to get where you're at when I know you've made some changes even recently with kind of the financial or, or how that all comes together how do you go about making big financial decisions now for your company I just got goosebumps as you asked me that because it's such a great answer um I get quiet and I get by myself so I oftentimes will go on like a Katie retreat or, you know, a solo retreat away. And for me, because I have little ones at home, like, you know, that's an hour away at like, you know, a hotel, you know, that I can stay at for like two nights and just like have no responsibilities other than myself. And so um, if I can't do that, then it's just a lot of walks, you know, either by myself or with me and my husband in nature. We do that. That is a foundation of our relationship. Um, so it's sort of, it's sort of, I would say 40% talking things out with him and sort of like being mostly so that I can hear myself process it. Um, and also we're partners in life, right? And so we're financial partners and we have big dreams together. Like our businesses are separate, but very intertwined. And so, um, and how we express prosperity and attract prosperity in our lives is very much a, game, a team sport in our, in our family. So, you know, it's talking it out with him, but then 60% of it is ultimately me getting quiet with myself and listening for those whispers inside. Um, you know, you, you spoke to this. So just recently, I, I have the vast majority of income that comes into my business is done through sponsorship, through ad revenue. It's a very traditional kind of broadcasting model, right? Uh, there are plenty of podcasts out there who do not do it this way. My old podcast did not do it this way. Um, 
it, but I knew that this was a way that I wanted to monetize. And so for five and a half years, I have been doing it independently, meaning I work with like four or five different advertising agencies or, or media companies, and they all sort of, you know, uh, they're matchmakers, if you will. So they're the ones like bringing me sponsors. There's a lot of freedom in that because I'm not tied to anyone and I can get sponsors from just about everyone. Um, there, there are some downsides to that in that, you know, you've got multiple people selling me and therefore it sort of can drive down the price, if you will. Uh, anyway, to make a long story short, um, Q4 of last, Q3, Q4 of last year of 2023, I was approached by a, a big media company who said, we really want to partner with you. And it would mean that you're now exclusive with us, right? Like you cannot get sponsors from any, anybody else. They have to come through us. And there's big pros and cons to that, right? It was a giant, giant decision. Um, and, you know, it's a multi-year contract. And so it just happened to be that right before they kind of came at me with like a final offer, I happened to go on a little solo retreat and I got really clear about like, you know, I sort of had this um, entrepreneurial voice over here on one shoulder who was like, I want my freedom. I want to be able to, you know, have my freedom and do what I want when I want. I want to be able to speed up, slow down, all that sort of stuff. Pros and cons to that, right? And then there's this voice over here on the other shoulder that was very much like the giant visionary, like, wow, like, come on, Katie. Like, if you really want to get to the next level, this partnership could be really good. And here's why. And so there were a lot, a lot of conversations. And I walked away from that solo retreat just so on fire and knowing and ha having had the clarity and the the space to hear this voice in my head that was like, you have come too far to just, just slowly like, you know, settle in. I'm not somebody who settles in. That's not what I do. I don't get complacent. I don't get comfortable. That's not who I am. Who are you kidding that you don't want to keep on like, like going for broke? Like, let's go. And so I got really clear, like, yes, this is a spawn, this is the partnership, and yes, it's it's going to be different, and let's go. So, um, so that partnership has been is now a couple months old, and it's going really well. Um, and so I continue to kind of like come inside to listen to myself and to hear what that inner guidance is, and I'll I'll give myself lots of time and space in order to do that. You know, I'll journal about it, like anything that I can do to just ultimately ask. What is best for me? What is best for my family? What is best for the mission of this company? And um, and what's the worst that can happen? Because I will go there a lot. Like, what's the worst that can happen? And is the worst case scenario that bad? And it like how, how does that play against the risk of this? Of the risk of the potential? How good could it actually be? So, yeah, it's sort of like kind of 20% analytical with like the data in front of me and 80% just like, what does my gut say? Mm, this listening to yourself, this ability to get away, to take space and time that could otherwise be used in different places, like knowing that that's so, so, so important to you. Has it always been that way? Yeah, you know, I, I think that listening to your intuition and taking action on what she tells you is a is a muscle. And I think it's a it's a skill that you have to come continue to work and build that muscle. Um, and I feel like as a young kid, definitely into my teens, into my young adulthood, like I had parents who raised me to be pretty darn independent. And so, you know. I I have very crisp memories of me being like a teenager, like needing to make very big decisions and kind of talking to my mom and dad about it. And their response was always like, do what's best for you. You'll figure it out. Everything will be okay. So with that kind of a backdrop, like I, I feel like I was forced in some ways, I'm sure, you know, frustratingly so at the moment, but I was forced to start making decisions for myself and start um, really lit like asking myself, what should I do? And trying to do my best to actually listen to the answers that were there and then having courage to take action on them. And that pattern right there, I've done thousands of times at this point. So, you know, the first time was hard and maybe the actions weren't the right, were, maybe the actions didn't lead me to where I wanted it to go. So, okay, let's recalibrate and reset. And I learned from that. 
or maybe it took me to exactly where I wanted to go and what and the results I wanted to have. So boom, now that muscle gets a little stronger, right? I've got muscle memory there. So I'm 45 now, like you start doing the math on that, like just, you know, hundreds of decisions every single year of just really tuning in, having the courage to take action on what your intuition is telling you. And you start learning yourself and you start learning how resilient and strong you can be. And I think the most important part of this equation, you know, uh, the most important part of this equation is knowing that no matter what, you're okay. No, there's no such thing as a bad decision. There's only like lesson. Okay, learn that lesson. That was not that was not the the best decision, but you know, what did I learn and how can I recalibrate? You know, I think that the thing that we all get stuck in, um, myself included in the past, is that we can get stuck in like, I'm so scared of making the wrong decision because it feels like I I've either that either leads me to a dead end. Or like I make the right decision, then the door opens up and, you know, it's sunshine and rainbows. And that's actually not, neither of those things are true. <laughs> Any decision just leads to the next, you know, opening that you now get to decide how you make the ne next decision on. So, and there's always blessings in all of that, all of that. So yes, I feel like I've always been incredibly self-aware and very inquisitive about myself very much in tune to like, what do I want? What's right for me? What feels good? What doesn't? Oh, that decision. Oh God, my stomach is churning in that. Or like, oh, my stomach is churning. Is, is that fear? Like, is that fear that's, that's unhealthy or is that fear that's healthy? <laughs> like, you know, you can really start to get granular on what all of these things mean. But yes, I feel like, you know, these days it, it is very much like I know myself well enough. I know that voice when she talks and I know I know what to do and I'm pretty darn quick to take action. And I think that's that's why somebody might look from the outside and be like, holy cow, you've built this network. You have 20 shows in six years. Are you kidding me? Like that feels like so much. And I, I actually don't feel like it's that much because I'm like, when you know, you make decisions, you go like, let's go. And I think that that's something really special about being an entrepreneur, about being not even an entrepreneur, somebody who's just in charge of your own life. Like you understand, I have a very, very deep understanding about the fact that like, we ain't here on this planet for very long. So I don't want to waste any time not doing what I love to do. I have a very, very low tolerance for unhappiness. And so I'm not willing to stay there for very long, you know? So I'm willing to move and take action on things that, that drive me towards happy and that drive me towards fulfillment. And you've made friends, it sounds like, with things that don't work out. So if you make a decision and it doesn't work out, that's not the end of your world. That's, you don't let that cause you to go into these spirals. You try to learn from those lessons and you keep moving. Because so often, my impression is from working with you know people from all walks of life, that if you're frozen from the fear of failure. It's just so difficult to get started. And then if you do something and it doesn't turn out, the ability to keep going is even harder. So that piece of you learning that it's just, it's just a thing. It's not something that you need to give more meaning to than the fact that I'm going to learn from this it happens to everyone. I'm not going to let it stop me. Is that what's going on? A hundred percent. And I feel like I'm, I'm reiterating what so many people who we look up to uh, and question, like, how did you get successful? How did you get this? How did you get that? I feel like what all of us can say is like, we just keep learning from our mistakes. Like I would not be here were it not from these painful moments, you know, and, and my nature is in like just resiliency, like getting back up, dusting myself off, having a good cry, processing it, learning the lesson. Like, I don't want to do, I don't want to feel that way again. I don't want to do that again. So how do I do this? You know? And I feel like any one of us could sort of like identify these, um, these parts of our lives that are these sections of our lives that we've done that in. Like, you know, before business, I was doing this in dating and sort of like, oh, okay kind of dating the same guy over and over, like seeing these repeated patterns. And finally it's like, oh yeah, okay. I don't, I, this is what I want. And therefore here are the actions I need to take, or here's the woman I need to become in order to attract what I want. Right. It's the same thing with money, with business, with friendship, with anything. Like who do I need to be in order to attract what I want? And we just learn in all of these 
uh, in all of these parts of our lives. So I feel like it's it's here all the time, it's just ready for us to, you know, t- participate in. Yeah. I know that you said that you had been meditating since your teens and you were really interested in it. And something that I'm sure you, you know, who you are and how you're showing up in the, in this world, in this moment, I think it makes sense that you would be able to have a positive impact in people's lives through the meditations. But I also want to ask this question of like, why do you think these meditations are having such a big impact? And like, what's inside of those that are causing people to come back over and over again? Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think it's a combination of a couple of things. So number one, you know, there was a little bit of dumb luck in the beginning in that in 2018, when I was starting to research in on the podcast apps, like, okay, I know I want to do, you know, podcasts with women in meditation. I would type in meditation and women and one podcast existed. And I was like, you can't be joking. Like this, it really come on. So I knew right away that there was an opening in the podcast arena. I knew that there was, I knew that what I had to say would be needed by a lot of women who were searching for those things, who were searching for meditation and, and didn't see themselves. So if I could, if I could just place myself in the right spot, if I could just, you know, be in that niche and create that niche and any woman who's searching for meditation immediately sees a drop down of meditation for women. And they're like, yeah, I'm a woman. I'm like, I can capture, I can capture people who are already looking. So what I'm like, let's go. So that had a lot to do with it in that I was kind of like perfectly positioned at the right time. Um, that I think keyword wise was just very wise for us. Keyword, you know, as far as a business strategy, being able to do what I consider podcast SEO, which is like being very heavy on um, keywords that are searched in podcast apps, has been a part of my strategy from the get-go. I mean, my my meditations, the title of my podcast are incredibly boring. Meditation for women, sleep meditation for women, meditation for anxiety, meditation for moms, healing meditation for women, daily affirmations. Like these are not sleep stories, you know, like I am not trying to be creative here. I'm trying to be found. And so I think that that is one side of the coin that that I have deliberately done things to make it easy to find me. The second thing is that I think my uh, I think my what I'm going to call my um, my unprofessionalness in meditation. Like I don't have a degree in this. I have not studied any particular school of meditation. I have not even gone to a meditation retreat. Like I have meditated in a lot of different ways. I'm a consumer and a practitioner of meditation. And I absolutely take that approach. I don't come at it of like, hey, I'm the breathing meditation expert. We're going to have a, you know, we're going to be doing, you know, breathing things. As a matter of fact, I was actually trying to launch a, like a breathing technique type of a meditation podcast a couple of years ago. And I was like, I don't know this well enough to feel like I could do it. Um, I'm not ignorant about all of these different methods of, of, uh, of meditation, but I think because I approach it as a practitioner, I am very approachable and couple that with the fact that I'm a writer and I'm a businesswoman who knows copywriting. So in my writing, I'm titling things that, I would want to find if I were feeling that emotion, right? So like if I'm feeling tired or anxious or sad or, you know, like I'm going to burst open, like I'm, I am constantly asking myself if I'm feeling this and I'm creating this, what I consider beautiful poetry and beautiful words that will guide a woman through processing this experience, what am I going to be looking for? And I'm deliberately labeling the titles in order to make them so easy to be like, yes, that's the one I want. That's the one I need. That's what I'm feeling, right? So so, um, so I think that that makes it easy to then click. Now I, it's easy to find me. Now it's easy to click. Then we get down to the heart of the content itself, right? I could do all the marketing in the world, but if I don't have great content at the end of the day, I'm going to get a lot of like one-time listeners. And that's not what I'm here for. So then it comes down to what I consider the art that me and my producers are creating. 
And I really, I, I take a lot of pride in this. You know, I've said multiple times now that I'm a writer. I There's a lot of pride that I have in the scripts that I'm writing. And I do have other writers who are on my team. I think that that's very important, not only for scale, but it's also important because I want there to be other voices that other people would connect with besides just what I have to say and what my experiences are. So, um, but for the stuff that I'm writing, I'm, I'm, I feel like it's really beautiful. I feel like I do have, I have developed a gift for being able to sort of like express and, and package up an experience of words that help people feel a certain way, like feel connected, um, feel like they're not the only one. I I get that feedback a lot. Like, ah, I'm so glad that I'm not the only one having this experience or I'm not the only one feeling this. And you, you, you nailed it like this experience. Right. Um, so I feel like the words matched with my producer's gorgeous music and sound effects. And like, we're not just slapping music on the back of a meditation of, on top of my voice. Like we really are creating my main producer, um, you know, he and I've been together since 2020 and he's like, we always, I always joke with him that, you know, we're like the Beatles, we're like Paul and John, like, you know, I'm writing these and he literally, before he goes and puts music on them, he's reading my words so that he can, he's an audio engineer extraordinaire. Like he's looking at my words, what experience are her words describing and how can I have music that marries that and enhances that and with sound effects, everything. So so I like to think that what we have created and what we do continue to create on a mass scale every single month is high quality, high quantity meditations that can fulfill every sort of emotion or experience or season that anyone can experience. And we're doing it with enormous amount of love and an enormous amount of quality so that the the person listening is like, yes, I get this. I mean, you... I know you've listened to many guided meditations. So like, I know you can attest for the fact that within the first like 10 seconds, you're like, I either love this or hate this because the audio sucks or I don't like that voice or what have you. And I like to think that, and the feedback I hear is that the quality of the 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 listening experience is just so profound. Wow, that is really cool. I'm just super soaking this up. The... um. I didn't know all of what was behind the scenes with what you're creating, but has it been that way from the beginning? Did you have a producer? Did you know because of your experience with podcasting that these would be important things? I knew enough to know that the audio experience had to be amazing. And I had listened to enough other guided meditations on podcasts to know that there weren't many others who I thought were really high quality. There were a few, but like you know, for the most part, it was, you, you could hear, you could hear like the audio quality was not top notch. Right. And that's okay. There's no judgment there. It was just like, no, I'm going to be like, I'm going to be where you put on the headphones and you're like, wow. <laughs> um, and I had, I took, I kind of took along the producer with me who had produced my interview show. And he, he and I were together for about a year before it was like, I don't think that this is really ideal anymore. He was definitely ideal for like more business, you know, um, interview shows. And then just, I mean, the universe just brought me Luca and we met and I immediately was like, yes, oh my gosh, I, you are an artist, I, let's go. And so from day one, he, he and I have just been locked in this mission together and doing kind of providing our gifts to um, in our own individual way to then present this piece of art to the world. Yeah. And when you mentioned that you had to put money and invest money into the podcast, was that part of it? Was I mean, that a big part was making sure that you had a team of people that could create that high level, high quality. Yeah. I mean, immediately from the beginning, I had, a, I had production expenses. Like, you know, I need somebody to, to produce this. I tried three episodes on my own. I was like, nope, nope. I'm, I mean, I'm good, but not that good. <laughs> I'm not going to leave this up to me. And, you know, obviously that wasn't a, a wise use of my time. Um, and, you know, and so it was like, equal parts production experience or production costs and equal parts um, marketing. Like I, I have always put money into marketing and growth and um, in any way that I possibly can. So, you know, paid marketing, any sort of free promotions, anything like there's just always been money and time invested in growing, constantly growing. And I think I've actually, 
um, I have to give my husband credit. My husband, my husband is just a marketing genius. He's a podcasting expert. He runs um, Podfest Expo, one of the largest uh, podcasting conferences in the world. And so he's always just been super like, yes, I'll do your marketing. Like, this is so much fun. Like he, he's a, like a growaholic. He loves this stuff. <laughs> and so he's a huge reason <laughs> that, you know, I'm sort of, I come at it as the operator and the creator. Right. And then he's like, Mr. Marketing, like, let's do this to grow. And I'm like, okay, I trust you. Let's go. So for many years we were doing that together and it worked really well. And that is a big reason behind our, our exponential growth in these, you know, the first half of all of this stuff. And it's only been the past year or two that I have sort of taken more ownership of that and taken that on and being like, Katie, if you, you can produce and have perfect systems all day long and have the most gorgeous stuff. But if no, if you are not growing, if more people are not finding you, you are not in line with your mission. Like, let's get going. Come on. <laughs> so it has been a big, like, you know pulling up my big girl panties in that, in that regard, like, let's go. Okay. Come on. We're growing. And I will always invest money into that, invest time into that, like always be growing. The, this is such a fascinating conversation. I'm so grateful for you being so honest and forthcoming. Uh, I have two other questions for you. One is about money and managing money behind the scenes like have you had to do some big growth in that particular area oh yeah and then the other question is back to I think I I told you when we last spoke that my daughter has created this content creation business and I was feeling like some of the things you said earlier were going to be very very helpful to her and I know there are a lot of young people out there that have had tremendous success you know in a short amount of time but I was also curious like what would you say to those folks who have got the, they, like my daughter's doing a lot of the business herself. And so I think that's what kind of instigated it. It's like, when, how might you know when you could successfully or when it's time to bring other people in to alleviate some of these things that, that aren't your strength and pay other people to help you do that? Yeah, those are both really good questions. Okay. Money first. Yes, I have had to do a lot of growth to manage money and cash flow and budgets behind the scenes. And I'm going to be very straight with you. Like it's been painful at times, <laughs> meaning like I have found myself at times being like, yes, this is so like, I still remember, I can, I still recall, I don't know how many years ago it was, but like I said, for the first, it was like for the first three years, we, I didn't make money. I was, I was underwater. Right. So I remember when, when things turned and I was like, oh my God, I just made five grand this month. Right. And then I still, I still remember distinctly, like I just made $15,000 this month. That is insane. Right. Like it blew my mind. So in, I knew that once the tables turned and I would get into profit mode, I knew it would escalate quite quickly because my expenses don't raise, you know, in direct proportion to money coming in. So my expenses can pretty much stay stable or just, you know, kind of like I would have like a big expense jump and then it could stay stable for quite some time. So anyway, I knew the profit margin would would escalate really big. And in that, it, I can look back now and say I got a little lazy, like, oh, I'll have I'm going to have the money. I know this cash flow is coming in. Right. Like, I don't need to be that on top of things. And so I had um, and still have I had a woman who sort of managed my QuickBooks, my QuickBooks online. And so I, I wasn't really looking at, any, at anything except for my bank balances. And I, you know, on a, probably on a monthly basis, basis, I would sort of like do like a handwritten cash flow projection just to make sure I was good for the next month or two, right? Because I know that big expense was coming in and that, it, I mean, it was very com convoluted, but but it worked for a long time and I could make it work because I had a good amount of profit that I was like, I'm always good. Well, last year, right about this time last year, so in Q1 of 2023, I, you know, I had gotten done with like, what's the big vision of what's going to happen this year? And it was about growth and I'm going to expand the team. I'm going to hire more producers. I'm going to have more shows. And I did that without properly budgeting how much that would actually cost. I was just like saying, yes, 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 yes. And, you know, on a monthly basis, I would sort of like, clean up the books, if you will. And so really, I was only looking at my money about once a month. Um, and if that and otherwise, I was too busy, you know, or I, I, pretty soon it was like three months. And then I was like, whatever, it looks like I have enough money in my bank account. And then, um, you know, it got 
I don't remember when it was, let's just say April came of last year. And all of a sudden my producer gave me his bill and I was like, oh shit, I don't have, I'm not going to have the money to pay this for another three weeks. WTF. Like it was incredibly humbling. And it was at that moment, I, I you know, you want to talk about those gut wrenching moments and, and please know, like I'm, this is the moment of like, these are, it's the painful lessons that will teach you <laughs> to rise up and become better. Right. And this is only a year ago. And so I really was just like crumbling. I had to swallow my pride and be like, dude, I, I'm sorry. Like I, I usually pay him right away. And I was like, um, you're going to have to wait for a couple of weeks. Um, and I, you know, like I had just hired on some people as contractors that I literally just like had to let go and to had to start downplaying their stuff. And it tore me apart. And I learned, I saw like, I cannot make promises without properly budgeting and forecasting. And so since then, um, I have gotten incredibly diligent. I do my own QuickBooks. I am, I am in there. I have money Mondays every single Monday. I have like two or three hours where I'm in my QuickBooks. I'm looking at numbers. I'm, I'm category categorizing transactions. I'm making sure I see my P and L's. I'm seeing what's coming up. I'm, you know, and I can still get better on forecasting, like, but I'm doing it well enough now. So, um, so it, it has forced me to have to do that. Um, and it was a pay it, like, it took me a while to sort of write the ship, if you will. And I was like, oh, I'm not doing that again. <laughs> so yes, on the money management part, I have, I have had painful lessons that have forced me to be better and, and I will continue to be better. There's still ways that I can improve. And, and I feel like I can be much more on top of things, you know, really forecasting into like, you know, multiple quarters out and, you know, being, being able to do what like big corporations do, right? Like they're timing these things like quarter by quarter, year by year. And I'm on my way there. Um, but I have to tell you, as much as it as much as it kind of wrenched my gut last year to have these feelings and to know I was upside down, it feels equally, if not more, empowering on the other end to know my numbers all the time. Like I there will be days where like we were on spring break last week and I was like I wasn't in my QuickBook. So I was like, ah, I don't know where I am. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> and I will find the mo it doesn't take very long. Like, you know, it it takes me just a you know 30 minutes if that to just like update things and i'm like i just need to know where i am and it's so empowering because i can make really smart decisions that way i can take care of my family better that way i can take care of myself better that way and i consider it the other side of the coin of manifesting and being prosperous you know i've i've had the discussion with folks lately about um you know, really living a prosperous life and, oh, there's always going to be more, there's an abundance of it. And I was like, that doesn't mean that you can not be a great steward of, of the abundance you have right now. So this is me learning again and again, how to be a great steward of my money, of my time, of my energy, um, and, and making sure that I'm on top of those numbers. You know what I mean? Yeah. Wow. That's really beautiful for you to share that because you're not alone. There's a lot of people who face what you're talking about. And um, I think when your business does really, like everybody hopes for that time when the business has the cash flow and has the money coming in. But if you aren't prepared for it and you don't know what to do, it can, like you said, lead to surprises that are are not e always easy to deal with, Right. Um, watching my daughter over this past couple of years with this business that has steadily been growing and it doesn't have a lot of expenses. So our mission, and she says to me, she and Kelby say like, what would we do without you? Like, how do people figure these things out? Because there isn't a job. Like I was a financial advisor for very long. We've owned companies for almost 30 years. Like there are so many things and decisions that you have to pick up and look at and examine because it's also it's cash flow is part of it. The other piece is like, are you paying more taxes than you yeah. really need to be? Paying, I was just going right? to say taxes is a whole other conversation. <laughs> yeah. And I'm not an accountant, but because I've worked with my accountant for so many years in so many situations and I'm out there in the financial world. I have learned so many things, so many tools, so many processes, so many approaches, and it's quite frankly too much for them to take on all of it at the same time. So what we 100%. end up doing is, 
every quarter we'll implement something new so that we can get it up and running, you know, whether it be S Corp and then payroll and then a certain type of, you know, insurance. And I mean, no time goes by without like, okay, now you're ready for the HSA and now you're ready for like these certain things with payroll, but it's, crazy because if you don't do that the amount of money that you pay in taxes is really high and it's actually not necessary it's absolutely not necessary and my attitude towards that is exactly yours like I've just I've done baby steps throughout all these years you know again I've been an entrepreneur since 2009 and I feel like um I have had plenty of painful mistakes of like oh shoot there's an eleven thousand dollar tax bill when I thought I made no money last year okay, I guess I got to learn a little bit more about this or find a better accountant, right? Or somebody who actually pays attention to me and answers my calls. So, um, but it, it has been a constant, like, I feel like I'm constantly learning every single year. I feel like I'm getting just a little bit better at tax planning, financial strategy, um, you know, and, and I very much forgive myself for not knowing it all up front and just know, like, just, I'm going to be guided to what I need to know next. And it might come as like a, a painful lesson that I have to pay, for, but I'll know it next time. But, um, but then it's just like the next best thing, like, okay, now I know a little bit more. So yeah. Um, it, it, and it's very overwhelming to feel like, oh my God, I need to know all of these things when I'm, when I'm doing my business and growing my business. No, you just need to keep taking one step at a time, but no, it's worth knowing. Like it is worth, it is worth knowing um, equally equal to almost more so than the actual art or thing you're creating in order to make money is the management of it, the strategy of it, um, the movement of it. It's equally as important because you need both in order to really be a good business owner and to actually do what you're supposed to do and be prosperous, which is what we're supposed to be doing as we're sharing our gifts with the world, right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. And, you know, there's been so much here and I don't know if there's a few sentences or a few things that you can suggest to people who are growing these businesses um, and making that decision of like when to bring people into the Mm -hmm. business. But I, I love that. And then we'll close things up. Yeah. This is from the perspective of a recovering control freak. (laughs) I love saying to you that I'm a Jill of all trades girl. Like I have done website development. I've done copy. I've done marketing. I've done finances. Like I literally, I've done operations. I have, I have done and gotten quite good at just about every piece that there is of business. That's good. And that's bad. Um, So I think the way that I approach it now is, and I think I'm forced having kids and being a mom and having a a definitive off time. Like I have, like I have to be done at this time today because I'm, I turn into mom. That's my language with everyone. Sorry, you want to record at 5 PM? I'm so sorry. I turn into mom after three. So, you know, and I don't, I don't go back into business mode until like 9 AM the next day. So it, it, it forces me to be incredibly efficient with my time and incredibly efficient with my energy. So that's actually where I'm going to start. Like in order for, it's not so much about like, what should you or what shouldn't you, you know, delegate. Um, But it's more so about knowing how to make more efficient your time and how to make more efficient your energy. And then know your, know your moments when you feel so like capped, like, okay, I'm, I'm like busting out of the seams. We, we all know that moment, right? We're busting out of the seams. I'm staying up late. I'm getting up early or I just can't handle this. I'm extra stressed, what have you. Then those are the moments to be like, great. What do I have on my plate that I don't need to have on my plate anymore? (laughs) And, you know, in my old days of being a business strategist, I would tell clients to kind of make a column that had, here's what I have to do. Here's what I want to do. And here's what I absolutely don't want to do, right? And then start with the column of here's what I absolutely don't want to do. And guess what? Some of those things you might still have to do. Like for many years, it was like, I have to, I have to do my finances. I don't want to do them, right? No, you have to do them right now. Like don't offload that to somebody right away. Um, so, you know, I would just start there in a practical sense. What do I really not enjoy doing? 
And what can I have somebody else do? And then you just practice delegation. I'm very big into taking baby steps into this practice delegation. Like it could, it could cost you very little. It could be something as, as cheap as getting a, um, you know, an intern from a local college where it doesn't actually cost you money. It just costs you time to train that person. So you could practice the art of delegating and getting help. Um, or it could, you could, you could ask somebody to do things that are relatively low cost, just so you can practice not doing them. Um, so it's really good. And you can even practice this around the home, you know, for, for those of us who are working moms, like there's a giant portion of Katie's the CEO of our household. And there's a hell of a lot of jobs that come along with that, that don't even, don't even then get me started about my job that I get paid for. Right. <laughs> so it was like, okay, you know, just a couple of years ago, I was like, what is driving me nuts? What's taking me so much time at home that I don't want to do? I don't want to do dishes, man. If I ever have to wash it, I, if I don't ever have to wash a dish again, like I will be in high heaven. And so now it's a matter of like, okay, husband, we need to have a come to Jesus. Like, could you please be in charge of the dishes? Like I can't handle it anymore. <laughs> so it's maybe it's delegating to kids, to, to spouses. Maybe, you know, maybe it's hiring somebody to come clean your house once, just do it once and see how that feels. And you know, it's not going to break the bank to do it once and just see how that feels. And now I'm like, I've got that happening every week and I absolutely don't want to fold another piece of laundry again. Like, no. So, you know, for me, where you start first is really knowing your energy and your time, being as efficient as you can with those things. And I've got a whole list of, you know, you know, little trade secrets about that about energy management and time management, but then it's really getting to know that bursting point and then asking yourself, what can I, what can I offload? Who can I do that with? And how much will it cost me? And let me practice it, you know? And oh. the more you do it, the more you're going to like it. So good. So good. I know this has been um, just an amazing conversation for me, for listeners. Like what can they do next? They want to listen to the meditations. They want to learn more about you. Where Where's the best place for folks to go? Yeah. So if you're interested in meditation, you know, we're talking about mindset really, and a lot of money and money stuff and abundance. I have found that meditation helps a lot with that because it helps kind of clear the space in your mind to start identifying your, your intuition, uh, maybe some blocks that you have, old stories that don't work for you anymore. I've got a ton of those meditations. So you can go to womensmeditationnetwork.com to see all of our podcasts or just, you know, look up meditation for women on any of your podcast players. You'll find most of our stuff there. Um, you know, but I would just continue to honestly read The Mindful Millionaire. Like go read Lisa's book. It's brilliant. And it deals with exactly, you know, this understanding of like, what is my relationship with money? and prosperity and finances. And again, I'm 45 years old. I feel like I'm still unraveling and unpacking and dissolving old stories that don't serve me in order to in order to really be as fully expressed as I'm here to be. And I feel like that's the work. It's constant work. So it's equal parts unraveling this old stuff and, you know, imagining and dreaming into life what's possible. So just keep on doing that work. Keep on doing that work. Mm, thank you. Thank you so very much, Katie. I am in deep gratitude to you and to all that you've built. It's just amazing. And you're, you're filled with so much wisdom and you've shared so generously. Thank you. You are very welcome. Thank you so much for having me here. I feel so grateful. If you've enjoyed this video, be sure to subscribe to the channel. That way you'll get all the latest updates of meditations, tapping videos, uh, different coaching calls that I share on the YouTube channel, and also be sure to take my money and chakra quiz. This shows you where you might be out of balance as it pertains to money and exactly what you can do for your next steps.